Watkins. Intentionally saying my name slowly that for a reason that will be obvious later. <laughs> I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. My family then moved to the Los Angeles area. And then my family moved to Houston, Texas because of a death in the family and later to Tallahassee, Florida before moving to the Midwest. And yet I'm still a person who prefers cold weather over hot weather any day, as many of you know. As a child and as a teenager, I actually saw little evidence of racism. But little did I know that I would witness much racism and homophobia as a young adult and as a more mature adult, to borrow one of uh, Benny's phrases. I was fortunate to have gone to integrated schools in the 60s and 70s where my friends were of different races and seemed to get along quite well. I attended the second performing arts school in the nation, with the first being in New York. The second was in Houston, Texas, where diversity was truly valued and celebrated. In many ways, this school was kind of a utopia uh, for me in comparison to some of the Christian schools that I would soon attend after that. In my formal education journey, I began as a biology student at Baylor University on a pre-med track. During my freshman year at Baylor, I had the opportunity to participate in a play about Baylor's history. I had a minor part playing a gentleman by the name of Robert Gilbert, one of Baylor's first black students and its first black graduate. I was surprised when I was written up in the school paper as Watkins played the part of a black person well. <laughs> Even while avoiding the quote-unquote natural dialect. The irony is that Gilbert wrote in his memoirs that his first professor at Baylor University said that he was truly amazed that he didn't speak like the N-word. About halfway through my biology studies, I had a scary nightmare that uh, led me to dropping out of the program and applying and auditioning for the music school. I was grateful that Baylor had an outstanding music school as well as a school of math and sciences and graduated with two music degrees and a minor in mathematics. I then went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, mid-80s. In my second semester of seminary, a few of my friends decided to hear one of our professors preach in his local church. While I was truly blessed by his sermon that was delivered that morning, I was disappointed in how he, uh, I was disappointed in how this preacher professor greeted me after the service. I stood in line to tell him eagerly how much I appreciated his words from God. And before I uttered a word, he threw his hip in against mine and tried to shake my hand in a way that he believed that people of color preferred to be greeted. I was a bit embarrassed and angry as I don't really like calling attention to myself and then left. Initially, I had hoped that my seminary experience would prepare me for foreign mission work, but later changed and studied church music. I was again fortunate that the seminary had a fine music program that I could make that transition easily. My seminary experience would see me through ministries in Baptist Disciples of Christ, Presbyterian, and UCC churches. My faith has been a vital part of who I am as a person. My family prayed regularly at home. We even had a designated room. We attended church at least three times a week. My siblings and I had had to recite scripture verses before we could eat a meal, and we couldn't repeat the same verse. We went door-to-door -door witnessing. 
My siblings and I had to learn the names of all the books of the Bible. And we were always asked, when we loaded up the car on the way home, what was that sermon about? And again, we couldn't give the same answer. So you wanted to be first to answer that question. <laughs> I grew up in Sanctified Baptist, Missionary Baptist, and Southern Baptist churches. So being Baptist is still a part of who I am in many ways. My maternal grandmother was president of an organization called the Progressive Christian Union of Texas. And I have to say that it was a very conservative group. It was only progressive in that it allowed women and children to preach. My mother was the children's warden, or better known as the minister of youth today. <laughs> And my family was known as the Melodettes. We had a gospel group that toured churches sharing the gospel in song. Scripture has been a saving grace for me. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 16, 13 that says, Be on your guard, stand firm, be a person of courage, and be strong. This was good for me when, as a young adult in the 80s, visiting a white friend's church and sitting in the third pew, an usher came to me three times and asked me if I would like to sit closer toward the back. And I responded, though, thank you both the, all three times. When I sold encyclopedia door to door, a job I hated, and I faced the muzzle of a gun, and was told that if I had been a shade darker, that I would have been shot. When for over 10 years, really over 20, no one took the time to learn my name. I had professors who called me everything that started with the W, but my name. I became a hey you, or just you. I actually think my name is easy to pronounce. It's pronounced exactly like it's spelled. When a privileged friend would joke, asking, is this the gay corner? When a family member would recommend that I forget about teaching or directing choirs because I would likely poison them with gay rhetoric. I remember the verse, love is patient and love is kind and love is not rude. When as a new faculty member in a college in Iowa, a colleague would ask me, wouldn't it be funny if we dressed up and sang me in my shadow for a college talent event? And this was just in 1999. When a barber would say to me in the 2000s that he'd cut anyone's hair of the Aryan race. When a fellow church member would suggest that my background doesn't represent the black experience. When many waiters have assumed that my white spouse was obviously the only one capable of paying the bill. I'm reminded of Matthew 7, 12, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. When racism and homophobia would continue to rear their ugly heads, I actually find solace in one of my favorite verses of scripture, Galatians 2.20, that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live is by faith in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. But I need to say a little bit more about music. I love that we serve a creative God who has a sense of humor. I grew up surrounded by music, but this may be hard for you to believe. I thought for many, many years, music's just entertainment. It doesn't help anyone. God would soon change my mind. I had thought that studying biology at Baylor and mission work in seminary would
would be more noble and a realistic fields to help people. And now I am certainly one of the strongest advocates for the need of music in our schools and the need of music in our lives. Again, I'm grateful that my undergrad school and my seminary had a fine music program so that I could make that transition. For music has been a source of escape, therapy, support, comfort for not just myself, but many that I've directed or just many that I've known throughout my life. In the 90s, I was nurtured in a Southern Baptist church for ordination as a minister of the gospel. But I declined because I was going through my own personal identity crisis, trying to reconcile being gay and Christian and not follow through with suicidal thoughts. I later went through counseling and finally accepted that what God creates is good and that I am certainly part of God's creation. And about that time, I left the Southern Baptist Convention. Jeff Cobb and I met in, while I was visiting a friend on a sabbatical leave in Chicago in 2001. I wasn't living in Chicago at the time. And we've been together ever since. We married in 2011 in Iowa, which was one of the few places at that time where same-sex marriages were illegal. And we had two honors, we had many honors, but two that quickly come to mind. One was having our friend, Reverend Lisa Gaston, officiate our sermon. And I'd like to add that Lisa's mother, Kari Olson, was greatly responsible uh, for my becoming a deacon here at Pilgrim Congregational Church. Happy to share that story if anyone's interested at a later time. The other blessing was having the Pilgrim Chapel Choir sing at our wedding. Yeah. And sit in the designated area that was for my biological family. You'll never know how much that meant to us. One blessing leads to another. The year after Jeff and I became a couple, he mentioned that a friend of his, Anna Razor, told him that Pilgrim was looking for a choir director, and he suggested that I apply. Again, I was, I was living in Iowa at the time. I actually interviewed twice, and was asked to be the choir director here in June of 2002. I'd like to close with a note of appreciation to Pilgrim Congregational Church, creating opportunities like this to share stories and add that worship is a huge part of my story and who I am. Last week, I had the opportunity to lead a session on worship and encourage everyone there to come up with their, develop their own definition for worship as a result of our shared discussion. We ran out of time, so I didn't get a chance to ask individuals where were they in that. But I want to share with you a little bit about my feelings regarding worship again, because that's part of my story and who I am. Worship for me is about daily nurturing relationships. And for me, that absolutely has to begin with knowing God better, with following Jesus, the way of love and allowing the Holy Spirit to work through me. This allows me to cultivate relationships with those in worship and to seek ways to celebrate and enable others to be in authentic relationships in their own lives. And this excites me about the possibility of worship, both corporate worship and <coughs> what I believe has to be a personal worship that exists outside of the church building, the walls of the church. Thank you. <laughs>